Good Friday morning, seniors. Welcome to the very last of the humanities videos. It has been a struggle. I know it has been for you. It has been for me as well to try and figure out what is most important and especially to try to have the conversation without you there in the room because I, I feed off your questions and your ahas and in particular your huh. So I appreciate you sticking through this with me. But last time here on Video and Humanities, let's begin in prayer, but let's begin with the Lord's Prayer, if you'd like to say it with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, thank you. That, that actually is very much my prayer for you, that you be kept from evil, that you uh, find your place in his kingdom and that through you his kingdom and power and glory might be manifest. Let's uh, begin this before we get line by line into it. Let's uh, remind you of a little uh, graphic that we looked at. Remember underneath our right leg most of us are right-handed. The strength the skill is the biblical tradition. It's deep, it's embedded in us, all right? The story to Abraham, uh, the, the law of the, communicated through Moses, the kingdom and the glory given to King David, and finally, of course, revealed completely through King Jesus. The biblical tradition is deep inside of us. I pray it's sort of our automatic go-to. Of course, we have a left leg, a left, left side as well, the classical civilization, rationality, logic, those sorts of things communicated to us through the Greeks and, and the Romans, a sense of law and order and societal uh, structure and hierarchy, all right? That's very much a part of us too. Those come together in the medieval period, the Middle Ages. That's sort of our gut. That's sort of the part where uh, everything processes through. Uh, it's sort of the, the emotional center. I don't know about you. I don't know where the emotions come from, but certainly when I get nervous, I feel it in my gut, all right? So while we stand on the biblical tradition, less heavily, I would argue, on the classical tradition, the Middle Ages is sort of the processing plant, all right? It's that bringing together those two parts. And of course, then in the uh, 16th century, and actually 15th, a little earlier, they begin to break back apart in the Reformation, which uses the tools of logic of the classical civilization down here to critique the Middle Ages and say, wait, we've not been faithful to the Bible. All right, again, a very biblical restoration, reformation, but also using the tools of classical civilization and the Renaissance. All right, again, very much using the biblical tradition, uh, the statues of Moses, uh, the, 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 the baptistry in Florence, uh, all very much reflecting biblical tradition, but using the tools and techniques given by classical civilization, so a crossover here. But again, we begin to separate and eventually culminating in modernity, all right, where really the biblical tradition, and in a sense, the emphasis on intellectual logic and rationality begins to be forgotten as we focus on this world and the material world. The life of the mind becomes consumed with the material world. All right, quick summary, look back over these and see if you remember them. The classical worldview, ultimate authority is found in the forms, in reason, somewhere up above me, external to me. Reality is in that world of forms and we access it through reason. And this world is really a reflection of that. This world is 
not the most significant thing. The material world is simply a reflection of the world of ideas. And human beings, we have been given part of that rationality. We are able to touch that world of forms, and yet we live in material bodies. If you remember Plato's uh, idea communicated through Socrates of somo sema, the body as prison, and that at death we are suddenly released to go live in this world of forms and ideas. If that is what truly happens, Marcus Aurelius will say, yeah, who can know? All right, Socrates will say that as well. All right, morality, determined by ethical reflection, not on what might happen, but rather on what kind of person I am, and can I get in touch with these virtues, with these ideas of truth and goodness and beauty? All right, and last of all, our purpose, the goal in life is to subject these passions, this gut, this, this bodily desires to reason by the training of the heart, all right? So the gut which pushes against us is brought under control of the mind of rationality by training in the virtues, by training of the heart through reason. So the ideas and forms are made accessible through reason, through rationality, which then leads us to be able to look at this world through those ideas, through the material cause, that is, what is it made of? Formal cause, what form do we find it in? Uh, what causes it to change? What is the efficient cause behind it? Causes change in state, change in location, et cetera. And then finally, uh, one of the most important questions, Aristotle, and certainly the later Christians, what is the purpose of it all? Where is it going? What's its final cause? All right. 3.13. The Edict of Milan legalized Christianity up through 1610. Uh, Galileo's uh, work on revolution, excuse me, the starry messenger. Uh, authority is no longer found in reason, but rather in God who gave us reason, who enables us to think rationally and logically, but actually gave us more than that, gave us revelation through the law to Moses, through the story of God's faithfulness to the prophets, and particularly through Jesus Christ. Reality is beyond our comprehension. What we need to know is revealed to us. So don't worry about it again. What you know, you know, but don't worry about it. God is in charge. Human beings are images of God. We're embodied spirits, are in spirited bodies, tainted by sin, yes, sinners, but also made in his image, okay, with a divine spark, access to the Holy Spirit by regeneration through baptism. The moral order is not something we discover on our own. It is rooted in who God is. Be holy as I am holy. Or as, as, as Paul will tell the Ephesians, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and live a life of love. Right? Just as Christ Jesus loved us and gave his life as a sacrifice, a fragrant offering for us. All right. Uh, and our purpose, then, is to become like God, not to grasp at equality with God, right, as did Adam and Eve and so many more who say, I don't want to know God, but rather to submit and by doing so to become like him through trust in him and through obedience. In this case, it's not the world of forms or ideas, but God who is overall, and he comes to us through revelation. Now, through the natural world as well, true, but primarily through revelation to uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, through the covenant with David, and finally in Jesus, which enables us to understand creation. Yes, by the tools of logic, but understand, most importantly, it reflects God's glory. It is marred by sin. We read that in Genesis 3. And we also read that in Romans 8, that the entire creation is groaning as in childbirth, waiting for its redemption, which leads us to the last point. The world is not the way it ought to be, but it's not the way it's going to be. That God is working in Christ to redeem it, which he's already begun that process, and to restore it, which that's what he's doing through the church, through you and I who grab on to him and begin to do the work of Christ to continue what he began to do and teach when he was incarnate, enfleshed in Galilee and in Jerusalem. The modern era, 1543, that's going to be Copernicus on the revolution of heavenly spheres. Again, Copernicus, believer, 
but again, beginning to say, wait, the way we've always sort of accepted the Earth Center may not be right. 1919, uh, Eddington discovered that light actually bends when in the presence of a huge mass, particularly around the sun. We saw this during a solar eclipse, showing Einstein's theory of relativity had some empirical basis. In the modern era, ultimate authority is nature. While some might argue, well, of course, God reveals himself through nature. Yes, but we begin to lose that sense of revelation of God's presence back there. Reality is orderly and open to our observation and analysis. We can study it, we can understand it. Humans are the pinnacle. We are, in fact, still at the great hierarchy of being. We're at the top, all right? But what about God? Well, okay, for the purpose of our processes, we don't need God, all right? As Nietzsche would say, God is dead. We have killed him. We don't need him to continue to function. That's much later, but the the seed of it is there in the early modern era. Morality is determined through ethical reflections on consequences. What's it going to lead to? Of course, I would argue that sometimes you don't know the consequences. None of us had a God's point, God's perspective on it, but we begin focused on consequences rather than what kind of person we are, what kind of person God calls us to be. And last of all, our purpose is to bring this world under our control, all right, to use our knowledge, our science, our technology to bring this world more and more under our control. Again, that sort of resonates with the, the Genesis 1, right? To be fruitful, multiply, refill the earth and subdue it, have dominion, okay? Except Genesis 1 and 2 is dominion under loving God and in relationship to him. This is, again, God has been taken out. Notice how this flips around. We now start with nature, which we focus on the moving cause, what causes us to change in state, in location, in, in form, and what is it made of? What's the chemical? What's the physical analysis of it? As far as the form, in fact, we begin to ignore that. We don't care as much about forms. And certainly, what's its purpose? Uh, as Isaac Newton would say, I frame no hypotheses. Don't know. Just trust God to handle that would be what Newton would say. Later scientists will say, beyond our kin. And then through our observation and analysis, we find truth, but notice this, truth in a small t, a functional truth, one that will work functionally. Is it absolutely true? Is it the way things are? don't know. David Hume sort of put an arrow through that. And then Kant came along and said, oh, we can know through our minds because we have these frames through which we access the world. And we can be sure here, but about the world out there, yeah, who knows? Which finally leads us to the postmodern era, right? There is no authority. Notice the word no. There is no ordered reality. Human beings are not different from the rest of the world. Moral decisions are not capable of being judged by any standard other than, well, don't hurt anybody. And I would even argue, and what makes you able to say that? And then last of all, there's no ultimate purpose to anything. Choose your purpose. Remember the Sartre story, this student who came to him and said, should I go to war or should I stay and care for my mother? And Sartre said, choose. The student said, choose which? And Sartre said, choose. Make a choice. I don't know why. I don't know where it'll go. Make a choice. Uh, my framework, basically, we start with everything down here at the bottom. The material world, world of emotions, any world beyond this. But there is no great chain of being. It's all flat. It's just all there. And everything is interrelated. Remember the video we watched where even electrons going through a slit, a double slit, seem to realize when they're being watched, okay? Again, there are other ways of saying that, but everything is related. Therefore, what we do, we analyze through what we've talked about the last few days, beginning of the week, critical theory. What are the relationships, the social relationships? What are the relationships between the authorities of science and technology, between the authorities of government? What is the relationship to finally say, if we can find all these and flatten them out, 
remove all the structures there that keep us from absolute freedom, that at that point we'll be free and we'll be equal, that we will all be on the same plane. And again, as a, as a sort of call, it, it has some resonance, okay? It, it does. But notice it begins from the bottom and swells up. No ultimate authority, no ultimate meaning, no ultimate purpose. And that's where we are. That's the world that we live in. The world which I pray that you will be able to see through when you enter the university. And one last thing. You have an assignment due this afternoon. If you're watching this on Friday by 5 p.m., I want it early. And it's going to be just a series of questions. I'd, I'd like for you to respond in three, at least three sentences, maybe more, to each of these questions. I took this from a book called Restoring All Things that I actually finished just a week and a half ago. Part of my Colson Fellowship I've told you about. Here are the four questions I would like for you to think through as you go off to college, as you engage with others in this world, in this academia, in your particular field of study, in your particular social club or sorority or fraternity, think through, what may I do? What may I join with others to do in affirming what is good in our culture? I hope as you did the media project that you took one of your favorite films or songs or video games and said, what is it that's good? What do I enjoy? Why is it? How can I affirm that? Number two, what is missing? What is some sort of perspective, some sort of truth that we're all just running past it? No one slowing down to say, wait, what can we creatively contribute through the world of, of, of music, of art, of film? of architecture. What can we contribute in human relationships? Third, what is evil in our culture that we can stop? We spent some time Tuesday talking about the evil of oppression. All right, that what is evil that we can work together with others and stop? Now we may not in a fallen world stop everything, but it's the story of the, the sand dollar, the, the the man who saw the boy picking up sand dollars, okay, and, and tossing them back into the water, into the sea so that they wouldn't dry out. And he says, why are you doing that? It really doesn't matter, right? There all these others are gonna die. And the little boy said, it matters to this one. What can we do? Stop evil. And last of all, what is there broken? And there are many, many things broken. That's a definition of fallenness, of fallen sinful humanity, what is broken in our culture, that we can begin, believers with God's grace, to restore. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle that we have, each of us individually, through your education, through your experiences, you have some pieces. Who can we find to help us spin that puzzle piece around and fit it in to God's glory? and to the blessing of those around us. I hope to see you for Zoom session this afternoon at two. Be sure to complete that closing reflection by 5 p.m. this afternoon. Have a blessed day.